We Have Ways of Making You Talk presents The Cauldron by Zeno, read by Al Murray. Chapter 5 Alan felt Bilting jerk away from him as if to start running back to the wood. He must have realised the futility of his intention almost at once, for he stopped in his tracks and throwing himself on the ground rolled over, his rifle springing to his shoulder. He saw no sense in being fired at without hitting back. Alan's knees bent to join his batman on the ground, but even as he did so, his mind suddenly became occupied with the theory of small arms fire. Horizontal planes, quadrant angles, the axis of barrels, the culminating point of trajectories and danger zones flew disconnectedly through his brain. He realised that, when fired at from the air, many of these were no longer applicable, or if they were, their application would be relevant in a different way. He decided he would be a smaller target standing up. He straightened his legs and looked up at the diving Messerschmitts. Their menacing shapes, the roar of their engines and the chatter of their guns filled his visual world and deafened his ears so that he missed the sight of the hundreds of puffs of dust that their bullets kicked up down the length of the long narrow field in which he stood. And then they were past him and turning. They swung up the previous day's LZ, their guns blazing at the empty gliders. Alan shouted to Bilting and the pair of them ran for cover. As he ran, Alan threw a quick glance at the dung heap and was in time to see the head of one of the signallers emerge from the foxhole and hear the beginning of a remark flung at his back. Stone, the stuffing crows. You might as well have sent an invite to the bleed as you'd think. The rest of the man's words were lost under the pounding of Alan's boots and the throbbing of his pumping heart. They reached the sanctuary of the wood and flung themselves under the protection of the trees, achieving cover from view if nothing else. He heard the growing volume of the engines as the Messerschmitts came back for their second run, but this time they swung wider, leaving the long field on their left and concentrating their fire on the gliders. And then they were gone, the sound of their engines dying away as they headed east for the Reich. Alan sat up and wiped the sweat from his face. It had been a close thing, and ruefully he acknowledged the justice of the signaller's sarcastic comment shouted at his running back. Aircraft recognition had never been one of his strong points, in addition, he had felt confident that the fighters were their own because he had expected them, and now he became worried. The timing of the attack, just five minutes after the second lift was due to start landing, was rather more than he could swallow as coincidence, and he felt thankful about what was obviously a postponement. The Messerschmitts would have played havoc with the defenceless transport aircraft had they been able to attack in the first minutes of a landing. He could obtain no information from Company HQ about the probable time of arrival of the second lift. With the wood below him clear of Germans, he posted sentries and allowed the remainder of the platoon to relax while remaining in their positions. Muldoon returned with the information that Edwards had been picked up by a recovery party from 181 Field Ambulance. Corporal McEwen brought in a straggler from the 1st Para Battalion who had become cut off from his company and had made his way back south of Oosterbeek. He confirmed some of the rumours about which Allen had been uncertain. The 2nd Parachute Battalion had definitely reached the area of the bridge the night before and had captured and was holding the north end of it. Some, but not many, of the 3rd Battalion had managed to link up with them. The 1st Battalion, two companies of the South Staffs and the bulk of the 3rd Battalion were still fighting their way towards the centre of Arnhem. The man had seen General Urquhart and Brigadier Lathbury the night before but he knew nothing about what had happened to them since. The man was very shaken and it was clear that he'd been involved in some bloody fighting. The Germans had been using self-propelled guns and half-tracks. The 1st Parabrigade had only one battery of anti-tank guns under command, and these had been too few to deal with the armour thrown at them by the Germans. The airborne soldiers had been driven off the streets into the houses, and from their cover were attacking the German tanks with gammon bombs and piots, but they were making very little progress towards the bridge. Allen felt suddenly very angry. He had no idea why the second lift had not yet arrived, and he sensed that somewhere, away from the battlefield, there was a lack of urgency. The delay meant that not only had the 4th Parachute Brigade and the remaining two companies of the South Staff still to land, but that the Air Landing Brigade and the bulk of Div troops had to be withheld from the vital battle for the bridge and the town of Arnhem until they were joined by the delayed contingents. He walked deeper into the shade of the trees to cool off. Leyland watched Bridgman's back as the platoon commander strolled away from the platoon. The sergeant could sense Bridgman's anger, but he was not sure what had caused it. He did not think it likely that the subaltern was angry with himself about the loss of Manning and Edwards, 
the necessity of placing the Eureka in the best possible position for its signals to reach the aircraft with the second lift would outweigh the responsibility Bridgman would feel for the lives of two of his men. Leyland knew that his platoon commander believed wounding and death to be the occupational hazards of soldiering, hazards to be avoided so far as possible, but not to the extent that success of overall operations would be endangered by too nice a consideration for the lives of men. Bridgman looked always to the ultimate end. He had a flair for detail, and although his decisions were arrived at quickly, he displayed a careful and efficient approach to every task, while at the same time keeping his eye on the main picture. It was this ability to see the whole of an operation in perspective which enabled him to look on the lives of soldiers, including his own, as expendable. Leyland could understand this as a natural viewpoint of senior commanders and staff officers. They were concerned with strategy and the constantly altering lines on the war maps. By the very nature of the job they did, the individual soldier became an incidental and Leyland did not see how this could be otherwise. But what never ceased to surprise him was that a subaltern of 25, a regimental officer who was only a wartime soldier, an amateur, could reconcile his daily contact with men he knew well and liked with an unhesitating preparedness to sacrifice their lives in order to gain an end not immediately related to the unit he commanded. He transferred his gaze to the wood opposite him, half of him listening to the firing in the town to the east and far to the north, where he imagined it was the King's own Scottish borderers Brens he could hear defending the 4th Brigade's dropping zone from attack. The other half of his mind ranged between his wife and son at home and his section here. The newspapers would have carried the story of the landing north of the Rhine, and now Sally would know why she had not received a letter from him during the ten days the division had spent in wired camps before the operation. He had been able to write during that time, but he had known the letters would not be posted until after the division had gone into action. He looked to either side of him, where his section lay in line, their bodies pressed into the shallow grooves they had made in the ground. When the Messerschmitts had fired, he had seen Adams and two of the other new men tremble against the earth in anticipation of a bullet strike. He wondered if Adams remembered how his arms had frozen against the sides of the Stirling, and how he had been unceremoniously bundled out with Leyland nearly on top of him. It was easy afterwards to rationalise the panic of a moment into simply the slight hesitation while the body braced for an effort. Leyland knew this to be true, for something similar had once happened to him in Italy. It was a secret he had shared with no one else, for the only person who had known of this single moment of blind panic was dead. Leyland and Tate had been on a daylight reconnaissance patrol west of Barry, and they had both been confident that there were no Germans in the area. They had entered the village slackly, side by side, and unprepared for anything but the usual riotous welcome offered by the Italian villagers. They had been so unalert that they had not even been alarmed by the absence of the very people they expected. They had turned a corner, and there had been the three German soldiers, standing in the middle of the road, their schmeisses and rifles over their shoulders. Leyland remembered the frozen moment of flat-footed shock, Tate struggling to get his sten off his shoulder, and himself running back round the corner and towards a side street. He remembered the burst of German fire which followed the rattle of Tate's sten gun, and his own slithering, horrified halt as he realised that he had left Tate facing the Germans alone. He had found the courage to return, and peering round the last corner, he had seen two dead Germans and the crumpled body of his companion. The third German had disappeared. Leyland had forced himself out into the open and over to Tate's body. He had been dead. His report had been factually accurate and only false by omission. They had entered the village, been engaged by the enemy, and Tate had been killed. At the same time, he had rationalised his action nearly to his own satisfaction. It had been a reconnaissance patrol, its object to find out if the village was occupied or being patrolled by the enemy. Their orders were to avoid conflict and to get back with the information. He had done that. He had succeeded in pushing the incident to the back of his mind for months, but it had nagged and torn at his conscience until he had dragged the memory back from where it skulked in the recesses of his mind and re-examined it. It always came to the same thing. As the NCO in charge of the two-man patrol... He had been entitled to avoid inaction and to get back with the information, but all the rationalising in the world could not make his desertion of Tate anything but what it was, an effort to save his own skin without having given a thought for the man left behind. Leyland had learned to live with what he had done simply because he had examined his conscience and admitted to himself that he had been guilty of a momentary act of cowardice. 
His intelligence told him that nearly any man might, under similar circumstances, act as he had done, but not Bridgman. Leyland was honest enough to admit that the resentment that prevented him from warming to his platoon commander was made up of two things. A sense of inferiority when he compared himself with the officer as a soldier and a sense of superiority when he compared himself as an individual away from the battlefield. He knew of the completely amoral streak in Bridgman and while it shocked the Puritan side of his own character, he was forced to admit that this amorality may have extended to but did not adversely affect Bridgman's qualities as a soldier. Nash came over and squatted on his haunches by Leyland's side. Check your section's ammunition, Eric. And while things are quiet, we'll clean weapons, one section at a time. Yours first. The platoon sergeant looked round. Christ knows how long we're going to be here. Perhaps we ought to make a better job of these slit trenches. Get them cracking when they've cleaned their weapons. Nash got up and moved on to the next section. Leyland pulled his men 30 or 40 yards back into the wood and set them to work. The section was very quiet. First doubts were making each man consider seriously the consequences of the delay in the arrival of the second lift. Corporal Marsden looked at the clear sky through the trees over his head. When he spoke, it was to no one in particular. Whatever is holding them up, it can't be the weather. What the hell can it be? He turned to Leyland. Do you think there's been a change of plan? Are they going to drop them somewhere else, perhaps near the bridge? Second battalion must be having a hell of a time there, on its own. Leyland shook his head slowly. God knows, he said. It's probably something quite temporary that we know nothing about. I expect they'll be here before long. Marsden looked across to where the platoon commander was berating the men of Gorman's section for not having made a better job of their positions. Bridgie doesn't seem too happy. He's behaving as if we were going to be here forever. He loves this digging lark. You'd think his father was a navvy. Leyland smiled. He doesn't like it any more than we do, but like us, he's no idea how long we're going to be here, and it would be bloody silly to be caught by a mortar stonk with no holes to hop into. No matter what they sling at us, we're stuck here till the gliders come in. If you can't take evasive action, there's only one thing you can do. Dig a hole and get in it. Marsden shrugged. Leyland was right and Bridgman was right. But it was difficult to make men dig when they were not under fire. And when, moreover, they might be leaving the positions within minutes of completing them. When the second lift appeared, the firing to the north and west of Wolfhazer increased to a crescendo of sound and as he walked out onto the narrow field for the second time that day, Alan realised that the King's own Scottish borderers were having to fight hard to retain their grip on the heather-covered dropping zone north of the Arnhem Ada Road. His own platoon might well be fortunate. He wondered how Gordon Brown was getting on, for he had the task of bringing in the 4th Para Brigade, and at this very moment he must be lying somewhere in the centre of the battle raging between the Germans and the King's own Scottish borderers and the border regiment. He fired his very lights and walked back to the wood, glancing at the grinning, relieved faces of the signallers, and then at the landing zone where Nash had seen to the lighting of the yellow smoke canisters. It was almost a repetition of the previous day. Back in the wood, he looked quickly round at his sections. They were all in position, but the tenseness of expectation had gone from them. He moved to the western edge of the wood, and the smoke party passed him as they came back to rejoin the platoon. He stood watching the great horses as they swept into land, each one to its own accompaniment of sound, like the hiss of compressed air escaping through a narrow valve. He saw the incredible precision with which the pilots put down their unpowered craft and the short distance in which they pulled them up, often only a few feet short of another glider. He watched the landing zone filling with moving men and vehicles. He tried to distinguish the different units, and at first this seemed impossible, for all the airborne soldiers looked alike in their camouflage smocks. He looked instead for the weapons and vehicles which would identify them, the guns of the light regiment and anti-tank batteries, and the vehicles of the field ambulance. He spotted the typical infantry movements of the two companies of South Staffs as they formed up to move off, and he remembered they were yet to discover the change of plan, that the remainder of their battalion had been detached from its brigade and was even now fighting its way into Arnhem. It had taken 40 horses and one giant Hamel car to bring in the second half of that battalion, and Allen knew that by the time the last glider touched down, over 650 of them would have landed north of the Nader Rhine in two days. The German Spandaus opened up without warning, and as Alan spun round, he saw the first mortar bombs explode on the landing zone. The machine gun fire came from the wood reported clear by the border company earlier in the morning, and Alan cursed them as he ran back to his position. He arrived to find the sections already in action, their fire disciplined and controlled, 
and as he threw himself down in the gap between Leyland's and Blake's men, he heard the captured machine gun add the vicious crackle of its fire to their own gun's slower bursts. Searching the wood with his glasses, he managed to pinpoint the muzzle flash of a German gun. He shouted to the sections to cease fire, and then directed all guns onto the German automatic. Five LMGs opened up on the single target he had indicated, and the Spandau stopped firing abruptly. Their own firing had attracted the attention of the Germans, and some of the guns which had been directed at the glider element now switched to the Pathfinder platoon. Alan heard the startled cry of a wounded man in the wood behind him, where he had left his headquarters section, and the brigaded mortars. He quickly saw that their own tongue of wood screened most of the landing zone from the eastern tip of the German-held wood, and it was from this end that the enemy fire was coming. The Germans could direct machine gun fire only on the western quarter of the landing zone, although their mortars could reach any part of it. Bridgman realised that the curses he had called down on the border company were probably unwarranted. It was likely that they had cleared the wood completely and that a German detachment had slipped back into the far edge when the borders had returned to the position they were responsible for in the west. The glider men would be getting off the landing zone as fast as possible and with any luck they should not have suffered many casualties. Alan shouted to the men in Blake's section who were handling the captured German LMG to cease firing so that he could more easily assess the volume of the enemy's fire. He strained his ears, but he had to order the whole platoon to stop before he could be certain that there were no more shots coming from the far wood. Down to the left, he could see Brogren crawling up to a wounded man in Gorman's section, and on the ground in front of him the last of the gliders were coming into land. There were four of them, and, as if acting on a common thought, the pilots of all of them swung their machines to the east, and making a 180 degree turn, sank towards the deadly strip of open ground between the Germans and Bridgman's platoon. The overcrowded landing zone had put them off, and they were taking advantage of what must have appeared to them to be a better and safer place to bring in their gliders. The platoon watched helplessly as they came into land. Just before they touched down, almost in line astern, the German guns opened up again. The platoon withheld its own fire till the gliders came to rest and they could safely open up without the certainty of hitting their great bulk. Two of the gliders caught fire at once. There was no movement from the third, but from the nose of the fourth, two glider pilots jumped down. They came under fire at once, and making a lightning and accurate decision, they dropped on the safe side of one of the glider's giant wheels. Alan shouted to Nash to lay smoke between the gliders and the far wood, and within 30 seconds the bombs were dropping. He kept his eyes on the four gliders as the smoke thickened up, watching for any sign of movement. There was none. Even the two pilots lay motionless as if dead, and Alan wondered if perhaps they were. He stood up and fired a yellow flare to attract their attention. He thought it was likely that they were uncertain if the area behind them was safe. Bullets whistled into the trees around him, and as he dropped to the ground he cursed himself for a fool. He could have fired the flare just as easily lying down. He decided there was no future in wasting his smoke bombs to cover the movements of men who were dead, but as he was opening his mouth to shout to Nash to cease fire, he saw one of the glider pilots stand up and bend over his companion, He appeared to be urging him to get up. The second pilot lay still, and the standing man turned and ran unsteadily towards the platoon. They put scattered shots and a burst or two into the smoke to keep the enemy ducking, and he had almost reached their positions when a chance shot from the Germans brought him down. But he was on his feet again almost at once, hopping the last few yards into the wood. Alan looked across to where the heads of his two signalers showed above their slit trench. One of them seemed to be fanning himself with his beret, and as Alan fired a flare over them to attract their attention, he wondered what the man could be at. Their faces turned in his direction, showing white against the dark heat behind them. He waved to them to take advantage of the smoke and rejoin the platoon, and as soon as he saw them on their feet and running towards him, he called to Nash to cease fire. The smoke cleared slowly, hanging for a long time in the still air. Alan moved over to where he could see out onto the landing zone. The last vehicles and men were disappearing from sight, as they made their way to the divisional area to the north. Running out at a right angle from the southwest corner of the wood they were in was a sparse avenue of trees which had to some extent screened the gliders coming in above them, and at its point of juncture with the wood he spotted what seemed to be an abandoned jeep. Nash joined him looking hot and tired. The mortars had kept him busy. They grinned at each other and then both looked at the jeep. That, said Nash, is a turn up for the book. I wonder if we're the first platoon in the company to win its own transport. I'm wondering if we should be allowed to keep it. Slip over to HQ and stay by the 42 set in case the old man comes through. I'm going to have a look.
Low-hanging branches from a tree had screened the Bren fixed to its motley mounting in the rear of the jeep. And as he got closer, Alan saw two sprawled figures. Bilting pulled at the shoulders of the one crouched over the wheel and the man rolled out through the open side of the jeep onto the ground. He was dead and so was the lieutenant who had been firing the gun. Alan seized him under the armpits and dragged him out, laying him alongside his driver. The dead officer's face showed him to have been in his forties, an unusual age for a lieutenant. Alan decided he must be a lieutenant quartermaster and turned eagerly to find what the jeep contained. We need to take a short break now. I'll see you in a tick. Welcome back to Zeno's The Cauldron. There were three boxes of 303, each containing 1,200 rounds. Bridgman had been concerned about the amount of ammunition expended in getting the signallers into position and in covering the landing of the gliders. He could now replace it all and start building up some sort of platoon reserve. Tim Jordan kept a tight hand on the company's reserve of ammunition, but Bridgman never allowed this to worry him. He was a great believer in self-reliance, and the amorality in his temperament acted as a buffer between an inflexible will to maintain his platoon at a peak of efficiency and the whispering of a conscience which might remind him that this was occasionally done at the expense of other units. This worried him not at all, and now he was quite confident that the ammunition would be put to better use by his platoon than by any other formation. He pushed the starter, ran the engine and switched off. He removed the dead men's rations, personal weapons and the ammunition they were carrying on their bodies, putting it all in the jeep. Then he searched the bottom of their vehicle for mortar bombs, which by now were running short. He had started the operation with only 48. He found none. Corporal Marsden came through the trees towards him. He was wanted by the CO on the 42 set. You will disengage and proceed north to rejoin the company. There will be a guide to meet you south of the railway line and west of Wolfhazer. What casualties have you? Jordan's voice lacked its usual warmth, his words carrying an air of detachment as though he were thinking of other things as he issued his orders. Alan sensed that the division's position had not improved. He kept his reply as brief as possible, for he would learn any bad news as soon as he reached the lodgement area. Two walking wounded, sir. I shall be moving in five minutes. He called his section commanders together. We're to disengage and join the company. We're to be met by a guide south of the railway. We have good cover behind us, but I have no intention of getting up and walking away from the enemy. They are not LFC troops. If they were, they wouldn't have come back after being driven out by the borders. Sergeant Blake's section will remain here for 15 minutes after we move. If the enemy guess we're pulling out, they'll be after us like a dose of salts, and if it can be avoided, I have no intention of fighting a running battle as we fall back. He turned to Blake. After we RV with the guide, I shall give you 20 minutes, and then try to contact you by 38 In the event I don't succeed, I shall leave a guide with the map reference of the company area, but he will wait only a further half an hour. Any questions? The five sergeants sat in silence on the soft leaf mould of the Dutch wood, the quiet of their immediate surroundings seeming a thing apart from the noise of the battles to the east and north of them. Nash made a suggestion. Why not take the whole platoon, sir, and leave a man with me? We can use the Bren on the jeep if we're engaged, and we can drive in it when your time limit expires. Like that, you'll keep the platoon together and we'll be able to rejoin you much quicker than a section on foot. Alan considered the suggestion. He had intended ferrying most of the platoon in relays in the jeep while they were still in the cover of the ride, but the platoon sergeant's suggestion was better. Good idea, sergeant. We'll do just that. Break open two of the boxes of 303 and distribute the bandoliers among the sections. Keep the other box with you in case you need it. He turned to his section commanders. Prepare your men to move, and when Sergeant Nash is in position, form up under cover of this side of the ride. Order of March, Blake, Leyland, Platoon HQ, Gorman. Nash called to Muldoon, and together they walked over to where the jeep stood under the cover of the trees. They broke open the ammunition boxes, and as the sections filed past, they handed out the cloth bandoliers. One or two of the men muttered about the extra weight, and wondered why it could not stay in the jeep till it joined them in the company area. Nash did not bother to reply. He had thought of the same thing himself, and he knew Bridgman must have done. But he also knew the platoon commander had a thing about ammunition and hated it to be in one place and his platoon in another, no matter for how short a period. Bridgman and Nash synchronised their watches, and the lieutenant looked out at the open field. Well, if they do take a crack at you, you've got a bloody fine killing ground. 
With a wave of his hand, he started to move away, telling Bilting to go over and pick up the personal weapons, ammunition and rations belonging to the dead men. Muldoon was in the back of the jeep, and as Bilting left them and followed Bridgman up to the waiting platoon, he asked, Shall I get the bread off the mounting, sir? It'll be better on the ground. We should be a hell of a target up here if they spotted us. Nash shook his head. No, he said. The ground rises very slightly in the centre and then falls away again. That's the main reason why we only had two men hit. Black was firing over a log and Jarvis was kneeling. If they can't hit us from ground level, we can't hit them. We'll keep it on the mounting. It's easier to traverse anyway. Nash climbed up into the jeep and got behind the gun, while Mundoon stacked Bren gun magazines ready to hand. He looked at the glider behind him, which the two pilots had sheltered, and wondered if the second pilot was still alive. The man who had hopped into their positions had had a slight flesh wound in the calf of his leg, which he had received just before he reached the wood, and another slightly worse in his upper arm, which he had collected while hiding behind the glider wheel. Before limping off to the north, he had told them that the other pilot was not badly wounded, but was not prepared to leave the cover of his glider. Nash grunted to himself. The pilot was no concern of his. The man had had his opportunity and had declined to take it. You seldom had a second chance in war. A movement to the southeast attracted his attention and he moved his head to see better through the leaves. A section of Germans had left their cover and were running towards the shelter of the gliders which the platoon had brought in on the previous day. Nash swung the gun round onto its mounting and waited. The Germans had dropped out of sight behind the glider nearest to their corner of the wood. They were 300 or 350 yards away, and Nash realised that if they were allowed to cover another 50 yards, they would be hidden from him by the width of the wood in which he and Muldoon were concealed. They could enter it at any point above the previous day's platoon RV. Nash raised his sights and looked to the aperture. When the Germans reappeared, they were running hard, their weapons at the trail, and as Nash aimed off in front of the running figures, he was reminded of some tin soldiers he had had as a boy. He emptied his magazine in one long burst, swinging the gun slowly in towards the running Germans as he fired. With the exception of one man, they hit the ground, kicking up little puffs of dust from the dry earth as they landed. The dead, the wounded and the unharmed impossible to distinguish from where the sergeant crouched behind his gun. He swung after the one man who had not dropped with the others, but who had turned in his panic and run back towards the cover of the wood. Nash took his time. The enemy soldier was within ten yards of safety, and must have felt already the first upsurge of hope when Nash shot him. The sergeant had just time to look back at the figures of the German section scattered on the ground and to notice movement from two of them when the Spandau opened up to his right from inside the opposite wood. They had pinpointed his locality fairly accurately and bullets hit the trees and tore through the bushes around him. A few hit the jeep below him and he felt a sharp tug at his left leg. He looked down to see if Muldoon was trying to attract his attention, but Muldoon was crouching on his left, a third magazine in his hand, and Nash realised that he had been hit, and also that the first magazine change had been so fast and so efficiently affected that he could barely recall it. There was another burst from the Spandau, followed by the explosion of one of the jeep's tyres, and the little vehicle sagged over to the left. As it settled, Nash picked out the muzzle flash of the German gun. He lowered his sights, and emptied the remainder of the magazine in its direction. He shouted to Muldoon to get out with the rest of the magazines for the gun, and unfixing the Bren from the motley mounting, he followed him. They threw themselves down ten yards inside the wood. At once, Nash started crawling to the southern edge of the wood, fifteen yards east of where they had abandoned the jeep. He could hear Muldoon grunting along behind him. He stopped a few feet short of the open ground and raised his glasses. With his body propped up on his elbows, he looked at the spot where he had picked up the Spandau fire, and was in time to see its flash again. He heard the bullets cut into the cover they had just left, and some of them hit the jeep again. They had got out just in time. The Spandau gunner was well zeroed on his target. Nash thought quickly. If his theory about the rising ground was correct, it meant that if he fired the Bren from ground level, he would either hit the centre of the field at its highest point, or his shots would go over the enemy gunner's head. He thrust out his arm at full length in front of him, and measured off on his knuckles the distance from a large bush to the spot where the Spandau was concealed. Then he looked round at Muldoon and grinned. Paddy, he said, I never thought I'd find a use for you, but I have. He explained quickly what he wanted and watched Muldoon's face change as he spoke. The big Irishman appeared to be disgusted, but there was a faint twinkle in his eyes. <laughs>
Isn't that just what you'd be expecting from a stuffing Englishman, he jerked out. Who else would think of the using the body of an Irish peasant as a parapet to protect him from the return fire of the poor devils he's been trying to kill for the past ten minutes? Muldoon pulled himself up until he was level with Nash and then crawled round to the front of him. As his face came opposite the sergeants, he turned it so that their eyes were only inches apart and his breath and the strong, sweet smell of his sweat struck human and warm against Nash's cheeks. I wouldn't have missed this for a barrel of Guinness, he muttered. What a story to tell in the pubs of Dublin about the ruthlessness of the English. He stopped and lay still when the haversack on his back was level with Nash's head. The sergeant folded the bipod of the Bren and slid the gun towards the Irishman's pack. He remeasured the distance from the tree, and when the Spando fired again, the Bren was high enough to clear the centre of the field. Nash's reply cut the German gun off in mid-burst. He lowered the button, waited. For minutes, nothing happened, and Muldoon began to stir restlessly under him. Nash looked at his watch. Twelve minutes had passed since the platoon had left for the company area. He wondered what damage had been done to the jeep. The flat tyre did not worry him over much. It was the near-side rear one which had been hit by the Spandau fire and would not affect the steering to any extent. But he knew the jeep had been hit many times and anything might have happened to it. He checked the time again. Right, Paddy, let's get moving. He slid the brain off Muldoon's haversack and followed by the Irishman, he crawled back deeper into the cover of the wood. They had just got to their feet and were moving to their left towards the edge of the ride when the Germans opened up with a combination of multiple mortar and spandau fire. Nash had hit the ground as the first bullet spattered like the rain of a summer storm against the tree and branches and before the rattle of the machine gun's fire and the high-pitched moan of the falling mortar bombs had reached their ears. While falling, he had looked towards Muldoon and had seen the Irishman stagger as if thrust against by a body heavier than his own. Muldoon went down slowly, his big face expressionless, but his eyes shocked and a little bewildered by the suddenness of his wounding. He hit the earth on his right side, his face turned towards the platoon sergeant, and he opened his mouth as if to speak, but a froth of bright red blood from his lungs dribbled out from his lips instead of the words he intended. Nash crawled to the edge of the wood, dragging his Bren behind him, he slid into one of the shallow section weapon pits and pushed the gun out in front of him. The mortar bombs were bursting on the ground to his rear and high up in the trees, scattering their fragmented death in every direction. He doubted if he could break back through the curtain of flying metal behind him and get Muldoon to the jeep. He waited for the mortaring to die down, and while he waited he watched the German-occupied wood for any sign of movement. The first smoke bomb landed directly in front of him, completely blanketing his view. He watched its drift to the right, and jumping up he hobbled on his stiffening leg downwind to the left from where he would be able to see if the Germans broke cover. He had reached out to break the fall of his body when the Spandau burst hit him, low down in his stomach. He fell forward on his knees and left hand. His right released its grip on the carrying handle of the Bren. He sat back on his haunches, his mouth open and both hands clutching at his belly. The second burst took him squarely across the chest and he toppled over. He was dead before his shoulder struck the ground. Muldoon was sitting back, propped against a tree, nine-tenths of his mind empty and the pain of his chest forgotten. The blood tasted strange and unclean in his mouth, and he spat out a clot of it in disgust. He watched the sergeant's still body for what seemed a long time. One part of him was convinced that Jim Nash was dead, another and smaller part, the same part which enabled him to have faith in a god he had never seen and whose works were beyond his understanding, believed the platoon sergeant would get to his feet at any moment and help him back to the company. Through a gap in the smoke, he caught a glimpse of the advancing German infantry. He picked up his rifle in his left hand and held it across his lap at the point of balance. His right unzipped the front of his smock and groped till it found his rosary. Holy Mary, Mother of God. He had liked Jim Nash, and half the stories they told at home about the English were untrue. Pray for us sinners now, and in the hour of our death. Amen. The Germans were through the smoke and almost at the edge of the wood. Muldoon let go of his rosary and gripped his rifle round the small of the butt. It was as silly as drinking flat porter, for his eyes wouldn't focus properly, and the German soldiers seemed to dance to the left and right as they came into the wood. The company had a new area, two miles to the southeast of the position they had held on the previous night, and south of the railway line, beyond Johanna Hoeva Farm. The KOSBs were now brigaded with the 4th Para Brigade. They had replaced the 11th Para Battalion, 
who were driving into Arnhem on the lower road to reinforce the three battalions held up in its centre. The glider men from the Scottish regiment were all north of the railway line, two companies on the main Utrecht Arnhem Road and to the west of Johanna Hoeva, the remaining two companies above the embankment and south of the farm. The following morning was to see a brigade drive for the high ground to the north of Arnhem. The independent company dug in in the grounds of a large house. Alan Bridgman's platoon faced the north, Phil Ramsden's the open ground to the west, and Gordon Brown's men looked east to Arnhem. Alan sighted his two forward sections, ten yards short of the secondary road running across his front. He put Blake's section on the left, in the sharp elbow where the road broke back at right angles and ran nearly straight to the Hiveardorp ferry west of Oosterbeek. Leyland's section he put on the right where his field of fire was limited to some 30 yards. They looked down 10 feet of sloping grounds to where a four-foot wire mesh cattle fence enclosed the grounds they were in. Across the road, there was another cattle fence round an even bigger house and grounds, and beyond it, the shrubbery and growth of an extensive garden. 50 yards inside the garden, a tall four-storey house looked menacingly down on the company positions. Bridgman asked permission to occupy the house with a standing patrol. Jordan gave his assent, and before returning to his company HQ, added with a perfectly straight face, the Bosch has cut off all water supplies and I'm worried about our horse. See if you can rake some up. Then he walked away, leaving his casual words hanging in the air, an implicit order that the horse was to be watered. In his youth, he had ridden in the Grand National and in consequence his concern for the welfare of the horse was rather more than that for the remainder of the company, who were already referring to the heavy, hollow-backed animal as Tim's Hunter. Alan made up a composite section under Sergeant Murray and handing the platoon over to Leyland, he made his way cautiously into the grounds on the far side of the wood. The KOSB battalion lay to the north of him, covering his front, but the Germans had already started a determined infiltration through the many gaps in the divisional perimeter. An elderly Dutch woman met them as they entered the house. Her English was imperfect, but she spoke German, and O'Neill interpreted for Alan. O'Neill was one of the many European Jews in the company, and when given the opportunity of choosing a new name, in common with some of the others, he had selected an Irish one. She says, sir, that she is an old woman, and had better go, for she will be in our way. She says we must do what we must, but please not to damage her furniture too much. Before the old woman got clear of the grounds of her house, the section were preparing it for siege. They methodically smashed the glass in every window, they made their way into the attics and broke through the tiled roof to gain vantage points from which they could observe and fire. They stacked up Bren gun magazines on our upholstered chairs and on the big polished table they mounted a machine gun so that they could fire from the centre of the room, away from the windows. And the blankets they tore from her bed to lay over the table were not to protect its surface but to prevent the legs of the gun from slipping. Her furniture became breastworks to protect the parachutists from German fire. Within 15 minutes the old woman would have found the interior of her home unrecognisable. Alan returned to the platoon's main positions. He and Bilting, carrying between them a huge crock of water they had taken from the woman's half-filled bath. Tim's hunter would not die of thirst during the next 24 hours. The men were digging in with a better will than they had shown earlier in the day, and Alan realised that, despite his short field of fire, the position was a good one. Murray's advance section would serve to break up the first wave of an attack and give some degree of warning to the entrenched company. He had sighted a command post between the two forward sections, and when he got back, he helped Bilting to complete the digging of it. They would certainly be in position for some time the following day, while the brigade attack to take the high ground and northern suburbs of Arnhem was launched across their front, above and a mile to the north of them. He visited his sections for the last time after stand-down, and went back to his command post without having nominated a successor for Jim Nash. Despite the heavy firing they had heard as they moved to the company RV, it was just possible that the platoon sergeant might yet make his way back to rejoin them. Leyland was the next senior sergeant, and after him Bob Blake, but they were both too valuable as section commanders to be taken away from their men. He decided that if Nash did not return, he would not replace him.